Hello, this is a presentation for the uh, ISS Climate Solutions Consultant um, application. Um, I'm recording this um, especially just to be able to show you the visualization I've just created in Excel, uh, which shows uh, um, population growth around the world, um, economic blocks with population growing this way, um, energy consumption growing that way, uh, emissions as a glow, uh, and um, city air quality. Uh, starting quite bad and, and improving, but emissions um, being sort of somewhat independent of that. Uh, it's part of a bigger presentation that I've am <coughs> creating to um, upload to the internet uh, as a video. Um, but I've shortened it just for this purpose. Um, really not to, show, to say very much about carbon pricing. That's the main purpose of this presentation, really. But um, given that uh, you're looking for, I suspect you're looking for um, technical solutions and so I've moved a the, the couple of technical solutions up uh, to say a little bit about those and make the whole thing much shorter. So let's uh, whiz around to that. Uh, so I need to share my screen. Share the screen. Um, so let's go to the presentation, um, which is going to be called Solving Climate Change, Getting Real. My name is Clive Ellsworth. Um, I got a degree in electrical and electronic engineering at Bristol University <coughs> uh, long ago in 1983. Uh, and of course, um, climate change is a global problem. I think people often forget that and just focus on national targets. Um, uh, so, and the tragedy of the commons is the underlying problem which hasn't been solved. Paris has not solved that. Uh, the problem is free riders. Um, it kills the incentive for others to join the effort, as it says. Uh, so I'm not going to really say much more about that. Uh, I really want to get to the visualization as quickly as possible. Uh, okay, so the visualization uh, of course, it's pro uh, largely projections, uh, so they have to be estimates. It's making the point that p particulate pollution, so um, one of the people I've been speaking with, Stephen Stoft, um, a top economist uh, on climate change, um, it says that he's worried that people are just saying, well, we just people just need to follow their self-interest and that's going to solve the problem. And he's saying, well, it's not um, because the global climate interest is somewhat larger. Um, um, but one way to think of that is if we have effective global carbon pricing, if it, if it ever comes to pass, then as that rises, the carbon price rises, it increases the local or the self-interest um, for you know, people to invest in these technical solutions. So carbon pricing, it needs to be global in order to, well, it needs to be widespread at least, um, in order to eliminate the free rider problem. And okay, so this visualization assumes that what will happen um, is that gradually uh, fossil fuel, that carbon pricing will gradually price fossil fuels out of the market. To, um, raising self-interest to invest in renewables. You know, later, the smart grids is, is uh, more expensive um, and perhaps storage if that becomes economic. Um, but the thing that I'm <clears throat> excited about is advanced nuclear. Uh, more on that in a, in a moment after visualization. And it's assuming that uh, emissions will be reined in this century although not enough, not by enough. So I flip around to the visualization, here it is. So this is a picture of the world with the main economic blocks. Starting in 1960, uh, everywhere has quite bad city air, air quality. These figures here will update as I move the slider along. Uh, this, they're showing here the population, um, the, the important ones that change are the population, the per capita energy consumption, um, the emissions, annual emissions, and these pollution figures are rather estimate are estimates. Um, a lot of them rather rather similar. Well, I did actually find that on the internet. The uh, 
data which is quite easily available on the internet nowadays. Um, it's showing, I think this figure is um, not correct actually, uh, the cumulative emissions um, and um, the um, atmospheric composition of CO2 uh, equivalent. So let's start moving up. As, as we move along the slider, it's going up five years at a time. Uh, we see uh, you know, em emissions, uh, uh, per capita energy particularly increasing and emissions increasing. And already we start to see city air quality improving in the three most industrialized blocks, North America, Europe, and Japan. Uh, and that's over at 1990. So if we got to 2000, this keeps on improving. Um, and uh, China is still quite small at this point point in, in terms of energy consumption, but the emissions are shooting up there. Uh, if we get to sort of now, 2020, uh, very large, they've got, as we know, terrible problems with their air quality, um, but it's the same in the rest of the world uh, in, in these other economic blocks. And up to 2035, emissions are enormous in China. Uh, India is now growing quite rapidly. Uh, move up again, and China has made has been successfully improving its air quality, and that technology is shared, uh, exported around the world. Um, very good air quality in the original three. Uh, keep going. Um, Africa's population is growing enormously. It's already up to nearly 3 billion as projected. Um, quality, air quality, much better nearly everywhere apart from Africa. Africa uh, is not developing very well. Uh, they, they don't, don't have sufficient wealth. Uh, energy consumption relates very closely to wealth. Um, and uh, the fertility rate, uh, I suspect you know, uh, reduces uh, very significantly when uh, the standard of living reaches a certain level. So India has stopped really uh, in increasing its population, but Africa is still increasing. So it's the area of the glow that is a measure of the emissions. Um, anyway, so by the time we reach 2100 you know the color of the world is an indication of the um, atmospheric composition of, of co2 and it's pretty bad uh, I think we could assume that if it's this amount then we'll have gone way past the two degree centigrade sort of target um, and there'll have been lots of disasters lots of migration and, and, and a lot of conflict so we do need a way to draw down co2 from the atmosphere Back to my presentation. Uh, so there is a technology uh, which looks very promising to me and a number of experts. I uh, uh, re respect their judgment. <clears throat> it's called buoyant flake ocean fertilization. It's uh, the brainchild of an Australian um, engineer. Uh, that works by taking agricultural waste and coating it with uh, nutrients that dissolve very slowly into the ocean. Um, we have large tracts of ocean which are like deserts um, because of insufficient nutrients. That's a complete waste of the enormous amount of energy that comes in from the sun every day. Uh, we're not gonna have solar farms in, in the ocean, so why not use that energy to draw down CO2? Uh, so, there were experiments sort of 15 years ago um, that didn't go well because they released nutrients far too quickly. So this is very slow release uh, up to about a year um, and um, field trials have been going very well, I, I hear, um, off the west, uh, on the west coast of India. It's been funded by the Indian government. So a quintuple win is what I've put down here. So restoring ocean biomass, um, which includes, starts with phytoplankton, which is the algal, algal plant growth in the ocean, um, to draw down, as you can see here, the order of 40 gigatons, that's an enormous amount. That would mean using very large amounts of the ocean, um, but hey, uh, they need it. Um, boosting fish stocks which, stocks, which should make it profitable 
assuming the governance, obviously governance is a big issue, um, can be in place. Um, and the other win, of course, if we're worried about the earth heating up, then um, people working on climate restoration now are talking about a number of things, including marine cloud brightening. And uh, phytoplankton produce this dimethyl sulfide, which helps to produce um, more reflective clouds. Um, I've said that it's op opposed by environmentalists. That was the case with the original experiments. Um, it remains to be seen whether they would, you know, what they would say about this. Hopefully, they would allow it to go ahead. Um, the other main technical solution uh, that I think is very well worth looking at is people just call it advanced nuclear. Really, that's nowadays molten salt reactors. So you, if you take table salt, uh, sodium chloride, and heat it up to 300 degrees centigrade, it melts. Uh, it looks like water in a test tube. Um, okay, uh, and it's an ideal solvent, it turns out, which was experiments done in the 60s, believe it or not, in, in the US, uh, for dissolving nuclear fuel, uh, uranium and plutonium. And this is the big thing. It eliminates the main hazard that we have with today's solid-fueled nuclear power stations like water reactors, which is that if you have a meltdown, if, you, if the um, pressure vessel is, is um, bre breached, then you have release of fission products, quite nasty fission products that can carry in the air. And this is a huge public safety um, uh, problem. Um, and you get people panicking. Um, so I won't say anything much about radiation safety, but it turns out that uh, with modern data on radio biology, um, that um, radiation is safe within limits. And it's not, nothing like as dangerous as people have made it out to be. Um, there was some bogus science released in the 50s. Some of you might have heard of the... Um, uh, LNT, the linear no threshold theory, which has shown to be been shown to be bogus. Uh, so it's like alcohol. You know, if you drink ten bottles of wine, people could say, "Well, that's very dangerous." Well, yes, if you drink ten bottles of wine in an evening, then yes, you're likely to die of alcohol poisoning. But if you spread those ten bottles of wine over a whole year, that's a little sip of wine a day. <laughs> the body can cope with it. Um, background radiation. There's radioactive material in our bodies, in the air we breathe, the food we eat. The, uh, the clothes we wear, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I said I wouldn't say too much, so let's leave that now. Um, yes, so modern salt reactors cannot melt down. The fuel is already liquid. Some of them, the Moltex proposal, can use nuclear waste as, uh, well, they pre-process it to, to create the fuel. So this should mean that they, they are hoping, um, they're not counting on it, but uh, um, this is, you know, part of the uh, possible business plan that they will actually be, be paid to take this material uh, uh, because people would rather not spend the billions digging a hole in the ground and putting it in the ground and dealing with all the environmental um, problem, the um, sort of kickback that comes from that. This is the main point, cheaper than coal and most gas, uh, combined cycle gas turbine. Right now, they're just they're saying that they couldn't quite compete with that in the U.S. because gas is so cheap in in the USA. Uh, and this is a a estimate that was done independently, but from a different company than them. It was Atkins PLC. Um, it's a peaker. Um, so as I'm, I sort of often talk about the Maltex proposal. I think it's by far the best. Um, uh, so that's a peaker. I think some of the others are as well. In fact, the terrestrial energy one is. Um, so storing heat in big molten salt tanks, taking that technology from the concentrated solar power people, um, which means they can fill in the uh, intermittency gaps on cold and cl on a calm, cloudy days. Um, deployments planned, as you see, for quite a long time. It's because the regulatory process is so long. But they and at least one other terrestrial energy are engaged with the Canadian, Canadian regulator. They're the favorite regulator. Um, so in the case of Moltex, the, there's no further research needed. Uh, it's all been done. Uh, they've made use of a lot of uh, uh, knowledge on molten salts from academia. And um, 
and people who've done experiments and you know, people from industry as well uh, and they say that they've solved the co uh, corrosion problems as well uh, that's it on this presentation I think that's enough for you to know that that's enough okay so so we'll call it a day there thanks for watching